Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This presentation is designed to acquaint freshman dental students with the importance and the application of dental anatomy and pedodontics. By the time we begin the discussion of the relationship of dental anatomy to pedodontics, I would like to define pedodontics for you. Pedodontics is that area of dental practice concerned with prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of dental disease, injuries, and oral facial abnormalities in children. By the time you view this presentation, you should have had an opportunity to learn the characteristics of the individual primary teeth and both how they differ from and compare to the corresponding permanent teeth. A review of several general differences between primary and permanent teeth include, number one, the primary teeth are designated by the use of capital letters, A through T, beginning with the right maxillary second molar as tooth A and continuing around the teeth to the mandibular right second molar, tooth T. Number two, the primary teeth are a smaller size than the corresponding permit teeth, as can be seen in this series of models, of which this side of the patient is a nine-year-old, and the other side is the dentition of a five-year-old. You can see that the permanent central incisor on the nine-year-old is much larger than the corresponding primary incisor on the five-year-old, which is illustrated also in this area where the corresponding permit tooth, which will erupt eventually, is larger than the primary tooth. The smaller size of the primary teeth is also illustrated in this anterocclusal radiograph of a three-year-old. As you can see, the primary teeth are lined up along here. This is the maxillary primary central, and this is the man maxillary permanent central, which will succeed it. Uh, note the size and difference of the mesial distal diameter. Number three, the enamel cap of primary teeth is thinner. This is illustrated on this radiograph in which you can see the thickness of the enamel cap of the permit first molar is much thicker than the enamel cap of either the primary second molar, enamel being here, or the primary first molar. There is also a difference in the thickness of the enamel on the occlusal surfaces. Number four, there are proportionately larger pulpal chambers in the primary teeth than in permanent teeth. And this is illustrated by this radiograph in which this is a permanent first molar, a primary second molar, and a primary first molar. You can see that the pulpal chambers of the two primary molars are proportionately larger uh, compared to the dentinal mass than the pulpal chamber of the permanent first molar. Five, there are root differences. The primary molar, uh, which this is a mandibular primary second molar, has a much less of a root trunk and much more divergent roots than those of the permanent first molar. You can see the diverging roots of the primary molar here as opposed to those of the permanent molar. Six, prominent cervical deflecting ridges. As may be seen on this skull of a seven-year-old child, the cervical deflecting ridges of the maxillary primary first molar and the maxillary primary second molar are prominent as compared to any cervical deflecting ridge on the maxillary permanent first molar. Although your course in dental anatomy is intended to familiarize you with the characteristics of primary teeth, it is the purpose of this tape to demonstrate how dental anatomy of primary teeth is important to clinical pedodontics. Throughout this presentation, attempts will be made to relate to clinical procedures, one, the structure of primary teeth, two, the relationship of primary teeth to one another and to their supporting structures, and three, the replacement of primary teeth by their permanent successors. There are a variety of clinical procedures 
which will be included during the clinical experience of your junior and senior pedodontic clinics. Number one, behavioral management of the child patient, although not directly related to dental anatomy of primary teeth, is necessary to accomplish all procedures. Number two, preventive pedodontics. Of the oral hygiene procedures, toothbrushing techniques are dependent upon the shape and configuration of primary teeth because of the prominent labial and buccal cervical deflecting ridges, the toothbrushing instructions must be modified to include the two surfaces cervical to these ridges. This can be illustrated in this set of models. Because of the prominent deflecting ridges on the primary molars, we choose for toothbrushing of the primary teeth a modified scrub technique such as this rather than the press roll which would be a technique which would miss the cervical portions of the teeth. Number three, the guidance of developing occlusion and correction of minor malocclusions. The guidance of the developing occlusion requires the knowledge of both the time and sequence of eruption. Eruption charts supplied to you give you information of both time and sequence of eruption. There is minor variability in the sequence of eruption of primary teeth, but more variability occurs in the time and sequence of eruption of permanent teeth, particularly when there has been premature loss of a primary tooth due to extraction or injury. As an example, a premature loss of a maxillary or a mandibular primary second molar. This right posterior bite wing of an eight-year-old child illustrates a premature loss of a maxillary primary molar which should have taken up this space, resulting in the mesial drift of the maxillary permanent first molar and closing the space. This is also illustrated further in this radiograph of an older youngster where the primary second molar has been lost and the maxillary second premolar is now impacted and blocked out from erupting. An unfavorable pattern of eruption may contribute to developing malocclusions, such as ectopic eruption. Ectopic eruption, as illustrated in this radiograph, means a tooth which has erupted out of place. In this situation, the maxillary permanent first molar has chosen a path of eruption which has caused considerable resorption of the distal surface of the maxillary second molar. Congenitally missing teeth may be another situation uh, involving the developing occlusion. In this particular patient, you can see here that both the primary and in the permanent dentition, the maxillary primary and permanent laterals are congenitally missing. It is important to know this in order to guide the teeth which are yet to erupt into proper uh, alignment. Number four, Oral surgery. Problems of extraction arise from widely divergent, flat, thin, resorbing primary molar roots, as is illustrated in this right posterior bite wing. The premolar has resorbed roots of the mandibular primary second molar, and you can look in this very area here and see that a root tip has been separated from the crown of the tooth. There also is considerable resorption of the distal root, and this tooth, if extracted this time, there would probably be a fracture of this root tip right there, which ultimately, if it occurs, will result in root tips being left in the alveolar bone. Root fractures occur following the extraction of anterior primary teeth. This is a diagram of the normal pattern of eruption of a permanent tooth, which will replace this primary tooth. And you can see that the primary tooth is resorbed uniformly, leaving no remnants of the root. In a situation where the permanent tooth resorbs a portion of the primary root and then changes direction to erupt lingually into the mouth, it will leave a thinned primary root, which if extracted without knowledge of this thinning, 
may result in fracture of the primary root in this general area. Number five, restorative procedures. The restoration of caries and fractures of primary teeth requires the knowledge of dental anatomy of the teeth. The relationship of the large pulps and pulp horns to caries and restorative procedures is important. On this radiograph of a three-year-old patient, you can see the large pulpal horns in the teeth, particularly the mesial horns extending much higher into the crown than the distal horns. This is also important since you do see here a, this dark area, which is a carious lesion, closely approximates the distal pulpal horn. The size of the pulpal chambers decreases with age and abrasion. This is particularly true in the younger patient, and you can see that the pulpal chambers of the primary first and second molars are much smaller than those seen in the previous x-rays. This is, these are the x-rays of a youngster who is approximately eight years of age. The abrasion is seen, the difference in the pulpal chambers is seen in this patient first at about seven years of age, you can see the size of the pulpal chambers is still quite large. And as we progress to a little older age on the same patient, you can see that the pulpal chambers have decreased in size. There is also difficulty in restoring primary anterior teeth due to thin enamel, small crown, and large pulp. This is illustrated in this radiograph, a mandibular anterior occlusal radiograph of a three and a half year old, in which you can see there is very thin enamel, the pulps are very large, and the caries very closely approximates the pulp, making it difficult to restore. With primary molars that are badly broken down by caries, we do have to restore these occasionally with a stainless steel crown. These preparations require that the prominent cervical deflecting ridges be reduced to allow the stainless steel crown to fit. This is illustrated in the preparation for the stainless steel crown on which the cervical deflecting ridges are reduced so that the stainless steel crown will fit over this area. This diagram illustrates the reduction of the cervical area in the seating of the crown. The crown is first seated on the lingual and then popped over the buccal surface. This diagram illustrates the stainless steel crown seated in place and the lower border of the crown just below the finish line of the crown preparation itself. Six, pulpal therapy. There are two pulpal therapy procedures which are frequently used for the primary molar, the indirect pulp cap and the formal crease of pulpotomy. This radiograph of a three and a half year old patient shows a deep carious lesion on a lower primary second molar. The indirect pulp cap is utilized in which the majority of the caries of this lesion is removed, leaving perhaps a half millimeter of carious dentin over the pulpal area. And if you then will look at the next radiograph, you can see that there has been a filling placed after covering the carious dentin with calcium hydroxide and a base. And this then allows a chance for the pulp to heal and for the tooth to remain in the mouth. The formal crease of pulpotomy technique is reserved for the primary molar with a large carious exposure, as is illustrated on this model. You can see that the caries involves a large portion of the pulpal chamber. The pulpotomy itself requires that the coronal portion of the pulp be amputated or removed down to the openings of the root canal themselves. And this is illustrated by this diagram in which all of this upper portion of the coronal pulpal chamber has been removed. This diagram 
shows the final portion of the formal cresol pulpotomy in which after five minutes of application of formal cresol over the amputated areas of the pulp chambers, a medicated cement is placed in the pulpal chamber and a stainless steel crown is fitted and placed over the crown of the tooth. This primary molar illustrates a candidate for a formal cresol pulpotomy in which there is large coronal damage by caries of the tooth. This area of the pulp is removed and amputated and in the next film you can see that a medicated cement has been placed into the pulpal chamber and the tooth has been restored with a stainless steel crown. These examples you have just viewed will be just a few of the clinical applications of your knowledge of dental anatomy of primary teeth. You will have ample opportunity to make such applications and many more during your junior and senior rotation in the pedodontic clinics. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.